Hi everyone, welcome to The Prototype, a channel where I explore how to make prototypes from cool ideas. In this episode, I'm going to be making my latest project of connecting my ceiling fans to my home network. Let's get started. Hi again, thank you so much for watching, and if you're new to this channel, please hit subscribe. I'm trying a slightly different video style this episode. The COVID lockdown has meant I have to share my home office, which makes filming a little tricky. Anyway, in the last episode, I went through the process of reverse engineering my ceiling fan remote to connect it to my home network. I established a number of key assumptions that I could infer the circuit by inspection, that we could connect a microcontroller to the remote, that we could run it from 5 volts, and that we could create our own custom circuit to do the same. Well, the boards have been made and have now arrived. There was a little delay due to the virus, but they're finally here. In this episode, I'm going to be assembling the boards by hand and testing the finished prototype. Okay, because this is a one-off, I decided to assemble the project myself using a reflow oven. Although it only costs around $30 to get the factory to assemble, I do have to wait several weeks, so it's often faster to do it yourself. Also, it's actually kind of fun and not too hard to do. The basic process to make a PCB using a reflow oven is to first apply solder paste and then place the parts and finally put it into a computer controlled oven. The last part's important because components have temperature profiles, which must be followed carefully to avoid cracking or heat stress due to your boards. You'll see these profiles in the data sheets of your components, and more on this later. The easiest way to apply solder paste is to use a stencil, which I have here, to squeegee the solder in place. The stencil is laser cut stainless steel and is made by most PCBA places. I got mine when I ordered the PCB for about $15. In this case, I accidentally purchased a stencil and frame, which is used in manufacturing systems. For my one-off, all I needed was a small stencil, which was a little bit bigger than the board. So to use the frame, I need to make a quick jig and hold the frame in place. You can see it's a little fiddly to get the PCB aligned, and when you're mass producing these, you place judicial marks on the panels that hold your PCBs in place and have the same marks on your stencil. Again, I didn't do any of that as I'm only intending on building one. Okay, now the stencil is aligned, the next part is to simply squeegee the solder paste all over, ensuring you get a consistent layer of the paste on the board. With the solder paste in place, we now need to place all the components. For this I'm using fine tip tweezers and a bit of patience. These components are mostly 0603 in size, so 6 thousandths of an inch by 3 thousandths, and I'm comfortable doing them without a scope. For smaller parts I'd need to open my microscope to position them in place. In mass manufacturing this process would be done by a pick and place machine. Like making any PCB by hand, you start with the low level components and build it up. I take a bag, find the component description, highlight it, look it up on my schematic and then place it in the appropriate place on the board, being careful to assure I have the correct orientation on parts that require it and they're put in the correct place. Some suppliers allow you to upload your bill of materials directly, including designators, and they'll often print these designators on the label. I didn't do that unfortunately this time, which would have made this process much simpler. However, you should never assume that you, get you or your supplier got 100% correct. For example, even in this run, I ordered the wrong size for one of my components. Fortunately, I had a spare left over from a previous project. Solder place contains flux and is fairly tacky. This means that the parts will stick to it, and then when heated, they will flow into place as the solder melts. The surface tension of the solder will align parts to your pads, making for a quick way to have a neat board. Paste is kept in the fridge, but you do have a couple of hours before the flux splits from the solder, so you don't need to rush too much. I wouldn't leave it overnight though. The oven I'm using is a cheap eBay IR reflow oven, which you can pick up for a few hundred dollars. These are perfectly fine for small projects like these. However, the heating is not completely consistent across the entire surface, so I wouldn't use it for a large board. We'll see what I mean later. Okay, the parts are all placed. Now it's time to melt the solder. Simply place it in the oven, select the temperature profile you want, and set it to go. Why I love making boards using a reflow oven is you get a fantastic consistency with your boards and allows you to use fine pitch parts and BGAs, which would be difficult or impossible to do using a heat gun or soldering iron. A reflow oven is a programmable to allow the heat to climb slowly to below the melting point of solder, to peak briefly to allow the solder to melt, and enables the parts to flow into place. And finally, it cools everything down gradually. You can see here the solder just melted and the parts wiggled into place. That's the reflow. Also, notice how it came across as a wave? That's a limitation with this cheap oven, as it doesn't have a completely uniform heat distribution. After 10 minutes, the boards are done. Let's 
check it out under the microscope. These ESP modules are quite chunky and are a heatsink, especially the ground signal. So I find it's worth just touching up some of the castellated pads with a little bit more solder to make sure I have a solid connection. At the same time, I add the power and programming headers. If you remember back to my block diagram in the previous episode, I'm gonna test each block in turn, starting with the power supply. Hooking it up to a power source, I check that we don't have any shorts and I've got 3.3 volts coming from the regulator and into the microprocessor. Next up the processor, I connect a USB to UART adapter to my programming port and see if I can get a boot signal from the processor. Yep, now to load a simple hello world and see if I can get the onboard LED blinking. Okay, onto the output block. Using the same code as my earlier prototype, I flash the processor and check that the HDE chip is generating the appropriate carry signal. Looks good so far. Because I don't have a scope with a high enough bandwidth, I can't test the 433 MHz RF signal, so this will have to be a real world test. Moving the device close to one of my fans and selecting the output, yeah, I'm able to change the speed of the fan. Awesome. So that's the board made. The final step in this project is to make a simple enclosure for it. This project is going to be placed downstairs in my home under my kitchen console, where it can be giving me a temperature recording of the room as well as be close enough to the fan to be in range. I designed a quick and simple press fit case, adding a button to reach down to the button on the board. In hindsight, I should have designed the button on the board a little better and selected one with a slightly better tactile feel, or use one of these buttons protruding from the board. Anyway, after three hours of printing, I have my case. I assemble it together and place it in its final position. And we're done. So there you have it. Over the last two episodes, we've taken an idea to control ceiling fans from home network, and we've validated our key assumptions with a breadboard prototype before designing a custom circuit and making a production prototype. Now, if I can take this project further, I'd rethink the user interface and place a power socket like a USB port on the board and spend a little more time on the case design. However, for what I wanted it for, it works perfectly. It's now a permanent part of my home automation. Hope you enjoyed watching this video, picked up a few things along the way. Reflow soldering is quite simple, and if you're making many prototypes, an investment in a reflow oven is definitely worth it. Thanks for watching.